here we go. So uh, first of all, everybody, welcome to the Data Architecture Virtual Chapter. Um, this is a really cool month. We actually had two sessions this month. Um, what was new in SQL Server 2016 coming down the line, and then Grant is coming back to give another presentation on execution plans, which is wonderful. And thank you, Grant, for coming. Um, no, no, thank you for having me. After I screwed up the last one, I figure I owe you guys at least uh, this. Oh, no, no, you're <laughs> great. So um, the session's recorded. If you have questions, you can email me. Please email me, email me at rob at SQL Tigers. I do check the data architecture email, but um, I don't check it quite as frequently. I check it like every, maybe once or twice a week. So sometimes, you know, with Christmas and holidays, I just, I, I don't check it as much. But if you hit, if you email me at rob at SQL Tigers, I will get it and I will respond to y'all. Um, so let's get started. So, um, I hit the next screen here. Uh, so pass, pass has lots of data, uh, lots of chapters, and uh, I, I really encourage y'all to log into pass. And, and you know, there are a lot of groups. I mean, they have lots of great topics, and uh, like performance chapter. Ryan Adams, I think, is over there, and I, they just, you know, they always have in topics great things. And actually, I got one from Fundamentals today, and it talked about some great topics about um, schema, some schema stuff that I, I'm gonna watch. So. Uh, I encourage y'all to log in, and, and the, you go to sqlpass.org slash vc, and you'll get the list there. Here's some upcoming SQL Saturdays, um, Nashville, et cetera. So if you're around there, I, I mean, it doesn't cost anything. Just take out, check it out. It's really cool stuff. You get to learn and network and meet people. And the link there is www.sqlsaturday.com. So um, if you have any desire to volunteer or even talk for my chapter, please email me at rob at SQL, uh, .com, or you can go to the volunteer link provided right there. And uh, they always have great volunteer opportunities. Um, I volunteered and um, I, I got to host this chapter now and I think it's pretty cool. I enjoy it a lot and get to meet a lot of neat people. So with that, that's the end of my um, screens, which was really quick. I'm going to turn it over to Grant, so I'm going to change it. Here you go, Grant. Great. Thank you again for coming. No, no, thank you. Okay, so um, to – let me get that out of my way. All right, so to, so to set expectations for those who don't know, um, last month I did this presentation uh, for the virtual chapter for you guys, and uh, my machine decided to crash uh, partway through the presentation. Uh, we kept going. Um, because it was just I couldn't do the demos, but but we could talk to everything. So I just I just kind of answered questions and talked about stuff. Um, but I offered to come back um, and do this again. So um, we're gonna we're going to um, do the presentation again. But I'm going to kind of go through the slides real quick, and then we're just going to spend our time primarily in the code. So hopefully everyone's okay with that. I'm assuming most of you are, are back uh, from the first time. So. We're just gonna we're just gonna go plow ahead from here, guys. Uh, let's see, so these are the goals of the session. Um, basically, I just want to give you guys uh, pointers uh, for where to go because an execution plans. Um, we're gonna start off. The most of the ones we're gonna read today are gonna be fairly basic, but but they get crazy, and so you want to have some idea of where to get started, where what to look for, and so that's basically the idea here is is just you know where do you start, what do you look for. Um, please, please, please get in touch with me. My name is Grant Fritchie. Um, this is my contact information. My blog is scarydba.com. Uh, my email is grant at scarydba. My Twitter handle is at gfritchie. Uh, I don't have Twitter up right now, so tweeting at me at the moment won't be helpful. Um, but please get in touch. If you've got questions on this topic, um, on database performance tuning, on database deployment methodologies on database design on um, you know anything database uh, uh, or should say data lifecycle management related uh, Azure Azure SQL database Azure SQL data warehouse I love this stuff and I will answer your questions so please 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 get in touch let's keep going oh and by the way if you have questions on the pass organization I actually know a little bit something about that. Um, since I'm on the board of directors there. So please, 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 if you've got questions, ask them. 
So why are we talking execution plans? Again, we're going to kind of go through this real quick. I don't want to spend lots of time. The whole thing is, is execution plans are the window that we are given into the query optimization process. The query optimizer does all kinds of really cool algorithms to figure out how it's going to retrieve your data or update your data, and it needs to go through these processes to figure out how to retrieve the information, and you need to understand what decisions it made based on your statistics, based on your indexes, based on your table structures, and based on your T-SQL code. All of that stuff drives its decisions, and then the representation of its decisions are what's in this execution plan thing, so that's why we're there. Now, generate a plan, we'll talk about it, um, extended events, procedure cache, blah, 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 we're going to get into that, don't worry. So, where to start? If you take a look at an execution plan like this, you can read it pretty much just by looking at it. You can identify high cost operators, you can look at the operators, figure out what they are, what they're doing, but what if you're looking at an execution plan like that? Where to start on that execution plan is extremely difficult. There's, there's no indicators for, for which is the, the right thing to do. By the way, this execution plan was the winner of the Harry execution plan contest at uh, SQL Cruise at the year before last, or, or maybe it was last year. Anyway, um, as you can tell, it's a fairly hairy execution. It's also an uh, execution plan. It's also one of three execution plans I've ever seen that had an out of memory error in it. Uh, it's it's pretty unique execution plan. I love it. That's why I like showing pictures of it. So where do we start on a big plan like this? Well, I say we start at the first operator. The first operator is that operator all the way over on the left. The reason being is there's all kinds of really cool stuff in there. I'm not going to spend time on this right now. We're going to spend time on it in the code. We're going to spend most of our time playing with code, so I don't want to I don't want to waste your guys' time just talking to slides because this, this is a coding session uh, to make up for last time. So now if we're looking at that first operator, now where do we go? We've looked at that select operator. Do we go left to right or right to left? The first clue is English. The second clue are those little arrows, and our clues are contradictory. English suggests we go left to right. The little arrows suggest things are going right to left, and the right answer, of course, is both because one is a logical processing order, which is how the query optimizer sees the data, which is a left to right processing order. The other is the physical processing order, the order in which the data flows, and the data comes off the disk and flows through the other processes. So you want to have both understandings. Again, we're going to keep going. This is the good stuff. All right, so what do we look for in execution plans? One of the first things we're going to look for is warnings. They're easy to spot. It's that big red X. It's hard to miss. We're also going to look for the most costly operator. That 96% is an indicator. Just remember that, that that indicator is an estimate in all plans. Even though there are actual plans and estimated plans, the numbers that you see are all estimates. The, num the properties in an actual plan are, are pretty limited, and um, we're going to we're going to show show those. We're going to do demos on everything today, so don't you worry. Let's see, we've got fat pipes. You notice that one little thin little line and then that big fat line, they're slightly different. That fat pipe is just an indicator of data flow. You also have extra operators, and these are operators, if you don't know what a table spool is, or you don't know why an, a compute scalar operator is there, or you don't know what an assert is or why it's there. If, if you don't know what or why, that's an extra operator, and it should draw your eye at something to look for. You should also look for scans. Scans are not bad things. Scans are actually good things. It's an indication that the optimizer felt it needed to look at the entire data set. However, a scan is also an indication of load. It's a, if it's looking at the entire data set, that could be an issue. You also want to look at estimated versus actuals. The actual number of rows in this case is 434. The estimated number of rows is 1.6. That's a fairly wide disparity, 400 times bigger. You might want to look at that one. It's slightly different, right? So where do we look? Tool tips. I don't use them much. I like the properties. 
The properties have lots and lots and lots of details, and that's where we're going to spend our time today when we get over to the demos. Hey, look, and it's demo time. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, so now I, I suspect there are questions. Normally, I would pause before I did this and start at, and, and ask if there are questions. But we're going to go straight into the demos, and then I will pause as we work. So please feel free. Type your questions into the question window. Um, I've got it up on one screen. My demos are up on another one, and uh, we can go from there. So just let me know, and uh, we'll, we'll move along. Now you should be able to see, I've already typed one query here just ahead of time. It's select star from sales order header. Um, let me do one thing. I'm going to pause here just to uh, make a change. If you'll forgive me, I apologize for doing this right in front of you. Actually, you know what, I'm going to cheat. Let's switch to a different um, management studio. Right now I'm in 2016, I'm going to switch over to 2014. And we'll start again. My apologies. I just don't like the way it's displaying the execution plans, um, it, the window it's choosing to put them into. You'll see in a second. I'll, sh I'll show you the differences. It's just quicker to do this than anything else. Let's get the right database. Awesome. Let's zoom in a little bit so you can see. Get that out of our way. All right. Okay, so there's the same query as before. Select star from sales order header as SOH. Now we've got two ways of doing an execution plan. If you'll notice, you can click on this and it will say include actual execution plan. Or I can click on this and it says display estimated execution plan. Now if I click on display estimated execution plan, it immediately gives me a new tab, and that new tab has the execution plan. Now, it's in, in your case, you might not see the tab. What you'll actually see is what I've got here. It'll come out down below. And the reason I've switched back over to the machine is because I there's a way to set this up. I just don't want to go into it right now so that it opens up inside of a, a separate tab in the main window rather than down below here. And it's just easier for presenting to have it up, up here in this main window. That's all. Don't don't get hung on how it's on how it's coming out. But you can see now that I've got an execution plan. It's a select statement. It's pulling information from two compute scalar operators and from a clustered index scan. Also, this execution plan is great because immediately we've got a warning. Now it's not the big red X in this case, but it's the little yellow exclamation point. So right here, visually, we've got a lot of interesting stuff going on. So if you, for example, don't know what a scalar operator is, a compute scalar operator, that is an extra operator immediately in front of us. Or if you don't know why we're seeing two compute scalar operators from a really simple select star query, that also is an indication of an extra operator. We've already got one of our indicators also in that warning statement that we're looking at. And we have another one of our indicators in the fact that we have a clustered index scan. And we have another one of our indicators because we've got big fat pipes there. Those pipes are fairly wide. Those are the little arrows going between the operators. Um, I refer to them as pipes because it represents data flow. I don't think that's an official term, um, but, but that's just how I refer to it. It makes sense to me. So where do we start when reading an execution plan? Well, first place is that first operator, all the way over on the left, all the way at the top. Now, it could be a select, insert, update, delete. Uh, it can be several other things. If you're doing a cursor, you may see other operators there. But it's always that first one that you start off with. Now, if you look at the tooltip, there's no real good indication as to why I would start there. You can see that, you can see that it's a select statement. You get to see the plan cache size. You get to see the cost. But other than that, there's not a whole lot of good information. So, well, of course, it does have the warning, which is helpful. But if we right-click and select properties, so that we have the properties window open over here, which I'm going to pin so it stays in place, you'll notice that versus the tooltip, 
The properties window has a huge collection of data, just gigantic. Now let's kind of walk through a few of these and, and highlight them because it's incredibly useful information. For example, if you look, we have here compile memory and compile time. So how much memory was used and how much time did it take to compile the store procedure? Now this is a really simple store procedure, ridiculously easy one as a matter of fact, but still there was time to compile this and you can see it there. Also, if we look, we can see the cost. Now these are all estimated costs, okay? Estimated number of rows, estimated operator cost, and estimated subtree cost. Remember, even in an actual plan or an estimated plan, the costs are always estimates, always. Never, ever, ever do you see actual costs. What you will see are actual number of rows, actual number of executions, and a couple of other values. There are, in other words, there really aren't two types of execution plans, even though most people think of it that way. There is an execution plan and an execution plan with runtime statistics. That's it. The plans are always going to be the same. Now, the, one of the questions has already come up. Is it possible for an actual plan to be different from the estimated plan? Shortest possible answer is no. The actual extended answer for that is no, except in the situation where you get a recompile. And when you get a re recompile, you could get a different plan. But the plan that gets stored in cache, which, which we'll take a look at here in a little bit, um, is actually an estimated plan per the nomenclature of estimated versus actual, because it's a plan without runtime statistics. The only way to get runtime statistics is to execute a query. So if you remember, in this case, I hit, I hit the button to generate a plan. I did not run the query. So this plan is only an estimated plan. All right, let's keep going. The, another bit that we, I love inside here is this, the optimization level. Now this instantly tells me that in this case, the optimizer found that there was only one possible way to resolve this query. It's a very simple query, select star from table. What is the operator's one choice? It has to do a scan. It can't do a seek, it can't do an index seek because we're selecting everything. It doesn't need to worry about any other join criteria or any other issues because the query is very simple. So when you see a trivial plan, it's usually a very simple query uh, your options for tuning that query are limited to near zero. So it's usually just a, an indicator that it's a plan that you don't need to worry about, you shouldn't spend a lot of time on. Um, the other options that you're going to see here, we'll see over, over, um, today, is uh, optimization level full, or you may see no optimization level at all. We'll keep going because there's more uh, additional information. We also get the query hash and the query plan hash. These are known as the query fingerprint. And what they are is a hash value of the query itself, the T-SQL, and a hash value of the plan. And these are useful if you've got lots of, like this one, ad hoc queries coming into your system and you want to be able to match query to query or plan to plan for different queries, you can look here at the fingerprint and you'll be able to query these directly out of the plan cache and play with them. Let's see, retrieve from cache, false, don't worry about that. The set options, that's actually very exciting. These are your ANSI settings for the connection. Now why would you care about the ANSI settings? Well, the interesting thing is, is that changing these ANSI settings can lead to a recompile. Further, having different ANSI settings for different connections, you could have different execution plans. So if you've ever hit the situation where You've got a query, you've written it, you've tested it, it runs great, you hand it over to, you know, you're a developer, you hand it over to the DBAs, they test it, and suddenly it's not working well. And you don't understand why, and you go look, and their execution plan and your execution plan differ. 
Well, take a look at your ANSI settings and see if it matches the DBA's ANSI settings. The beautiful thing is those ANSI settings are stored with the plan so you can tell how it was generated. And then obviously we get the warnings. In this case, we've got a very simple warning. It's a type conversion error. Um, we're converting um, sales order, oops, a little thing went away, didn't it? We're converting the sales order ID and it may affect the cardinality estimate in the query choice. Huh, that's something we may have to explore because cardinality estimates and query choices and all that fun stuff, that, you know, that's important, right? That, ma that matters. So it's things that I'm going to have to keep an eye on. That, all of that information I just went over, and we're actually going to add to that when we get into some additional queries that we're going to run here. All of that information is why I start at that first operator. This tells me a ton of stuff about that query plan. Even though the query plan we're looking at, zoom back over to here, even though this query plan is very simplistic, I've got a lot more information available to me than, than is immediately apparent, and it's all in that first operator because it's going to give me all those great indicators. Let's see. Questions. Does the actual plan tell you whether it was recompiled? No, the plan won't tell you whether it was recompiled. It's something you would have to look at the um, properties inside the cache, in the plan cache, uh, system exec query plans, um, and it will tell you the compile time and also um, the uh, number of times that plan has been reused. So if it's you know compiled very recently or used only once, then you'll know that it may have been recompiled. Uh, if the difference on execution plans are runtime statistics, what statistics do the estimated plan use? Uh, well, the okay, so, the, so that's where things get, the use of words gets entertaining. By runtime statistics, I am not referring to the statistics on indexes. The statistics used to generate a plan are the statistics on the indexes, the statistics on columns. Runtime statistics are the number of rows actually returned the number of executions of a particular operator. We'll explore that further and that'll, I think it will answer your question better. Just to confirm, the set options would be the same for each node in the plan. Yes, the set options are for the plan itself, not for individual nodes in the plan, just for the plan. It's just plan data is in that first operator. Is the session being recorded? Yeah, it is. Um, why should we always start from the left or right while analyzing the plan? Well, you don't, you don't always start from either end. Um, logically, and, and this, this, is, this is how it works. Logically, this is a select operator pulling information from a uh, scalar operator, pulling information from a scalar operator, pulling information from a clustered index scan. That is the logical processing order. Physically, data has to be pulled off of disk, so a clustered index scan is pulling data off of disk, so it starts over on the right. Oops, lost my mouse. It starts over on the right first, physically. It's going to pull that data from disk, and then it goes through that compute scalar operator, through that compute scalar operator, and then returns to you. You need to know that there's a logical processing order, left to right, and a physical processing order right to left. And then read your execution plan accordingly. Don't always start from the left. It does not They don't always make sense that way. Don't always start from the right. They don't always make sense that way. Understand how it's processing it physically or logically, and then you'll be in better shape. Does this session apply equally well to SQL Server 2012? This session applies to SQL Server 2005, 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, 2014, and 2016. Uh, the basics on execution plans have not changed since 2005. So you are covered. Um, there, there are a whole lot of advanced topics that have changed, especially in 2016, but um, not so much anything else. All right, so we will keep going because we flog this one to the dirt. Let's do this. <laughs> you don't agree? No, no, you're good. <laughs> All right, so let's do this. Let's join this query, and let's. Um, we're not going to execute it. I'm going to. I'm going to capture a uh, estimated plan again. 
Whoops. Oh wait, my bad. That's what you get when you're typing. Never type in demos. You know that, right? Now let's take a look at the execution plan. Okay, so now we've got a more interesting execution plan, a lot more interesting execution plan. So where do we start? Same place as always. We're going to start at the select operator. Take a look at the properties. Go back over here. Now I just want to point out a few things that have changed. First up, optimization level is now full. So this is no longer a trivial plan. This plan had to make choices. It had to make decisions. The fact that we've got two tables in the query, it now has to do actual optimizations. It is not a trivial plan. So this is you know, very useful information. Immediately we're getting some stuff that we didn't get before. Next up, hang on, let me hit escape. If we take a look at the warnings, we still just got the plan affecting conversion. But if we look back over here, I'm hoping that you're spotting the big red X. Now the big red X, again, the properties are going to be there. And you can see the warnings. And in this case, it's very obvious. I'm going to, oops. Helps when you hit the right thing. And so we've got is no join predicate. So you saw the query I typed. I put no join predicate in there. I've got I've basically got a cross join. That's okay if that's what I'm going for. But if I'm not going for that, SQL Server has very helpfully warned me that yeah, you're joining these two tables together, but you have not told me how to join them. So I'm going to join everything to everything, um, but the execution plan is going to have a warning in it to in, in order to you know validate what's going on and point things out to you. From there, if we were reading this plan, we're going to go from right to left physically and see that it's two clustered index scans. They're feeding into compute scalar operators. It's also feeding into this table spool operator. Now, does everyone know what a table spool operator was? Don't You can't raise your hand, so don't worry. Probably one or two of you don't know. That's fine. Let's identify this then as an extra operator. So we need to know what it is and why it's there. What is it? Well, a table spool stores data from the input into a temporary table in order to optimize rewinds. Huh. Well, why would it do that? It's putting all this data into one place in order to, to optimize what's called a rewind. Well, in this case, the optimizer is doing a nested loops join because it's basically making guesses as with no join predicate. It's not sure what to do. So it's made a what's effectively a poor choice. It's pulling all the data from one table and then it's doing a loop, scanning one set of data against another one at a time. Right? So it gets the first thing from the first clustered index scan over here and then loops that data over and over again against the second cluster index scan over here. But instead of going to the clustered index scan over and over and over again and hitting your disk over and over and over again, it's created this thing called a table spool, a lazy spool. So what's that? It is a temporary storage, a temporary table, it says so right there, that it's storing that data in order to optimize rewinds. In short, Every time it loops through this nested loop join, instead of hitting this clustered index scan, it's going down here and hitting this table, oh, I'm sorry, every time it goes through this data set and every time it goes through this loop join, instead of going against this clustered index scan, instead it's going against the table spool and reading from that over and over again. So now we've eliminated the table spool as an extra operator. We know what it is, we know why it's there. Now, part of this, if you're reading this plan yourself, you're going to spend a little longer going, what the heck, why is this here, what's going on? Uh, whereas I'm just telling you what it is because um, I've done this query a few times and <laughs> know how it comes out. But the trick that you're going to do is you're going to look and see, again, at the properties, 
estimated number of rewinds, 31,000. So this thing is rewinding this 31,000 times. Interesting number. Let's take a look at this value. The estimated number of rows coming out of that scan is 31,000. Ah, the nested loop join does a loop against this data 31,000 times. It's hitting this data. Now, let's take a look at this clustered index scan. How many executions? One. It's estimating one execution. So it's going to run this data once. It's going to go to the disk one time, load that data into that temporary table called the table spool, and then hit that table spool over and over again. Therefore, in theory, reducing your the amount of I.O. you have. Now, John has asked a great question. For a table spool, is temp table done in tempdb or in memory? The short answer there, John, is Yes, it's done in TempDB. It's done in TempDB or in memory, depending on how much, how big this is. If it can do it in memory, it will. If it can't, it spills it back out to TempDB. If it spills it back out to TempDB, how much I/O did we save? Not that much. So you do hit issues where the optimizer makes choices that may not be optimal. Uh, and this, this is possibly. I'm not saying it is one, but it's possibly one. So the next thing you look at on a plan like this also is the costs. In this case, the nested loop join costs 96% of the cost. Hey, guess what? It probably is. It's joining everything to everything. And best of all, if we take a look at the estimated number of rows, 31,000 from here, 121,000 from here, and what do we get here? Um, a big number because it's the 31,000 times the other number uh, combined, so it's it's got a lot of zeros on it. Are there tables? Are there uh, situations where table spools a good idea? Yes, Marsh. This this is a place where a table spool is a great idea. Rather than go back to that disk all the time, it's going to that table spool. It's awesome. The only issue is is if that table spool is spilling into TempDB. If it is, then you have issues. If it's all staying within memory, that's a great solution for this query. The way to fix this query, of course, is to actually have Join criteria. And so now I'm actually going to execute this query. Oops, hang on. Before I do that, let's make sure we're capturing execution plans. Now I'm going to execute this query. It's going to take it a second or two to return. And we might see an error or two. Hang on one second. Oh no, cool. My errors have cleared. Good to know. The plan is different. Because we've defined the join criteria, SQL Server is no longer making poor choices. Um, that loops join is gone. We're no longer doing that. We've now got the same two clustered index scans. Why? No where clause, no filtering. We've got the same compute scalar operators, which we still haven't figured out what they do, but we'll, we'll drill down and take a look at that. But now we've got a merge join. Let's take a look at what a merge join does. The tooltips are handy uh, for when you just want to look at an operator and see what it is, because they've got the description right at the top. A merge join matches rows from two su suitably sorted input tables, exploiting their order. So if we take a look at, again, the properties, one of my favorite things, and you'll notice there are a lot of properties here, a lot of properties, is uh, this one. ordered true. So it's scanning this data in order. And if we take a look at the other scan, it also, whoops, didn't hold down the control key. Hang on. Bad presenter. It also is scanning that data in order. So we've got two ordered scans. It's absolutely taking these two ordered scans and it's putting them through one of the most efficient mechanisms of join possible, the merge join. Now does that mean merge joins should always be used? No. Just saying that when you've got two ordered data sets, it's extremely efficient. So in this case, then if you look at the costs compared to the previous plan, you'll notice that where we had 96% of the cost 
in that nested loop join, now we've got a distribution of cost. 28% is scanning for 31,000 rows, and you'll notice the estimated and the actual are the same, and 54% for 121,000 rows. And you think, well, 28, 54, you know, 31,000 to 151,000, it's, it's a little more than double, uh, a little more than triple, really, but wow, okay, so the, the actual cost, those cost estimates, and they're not actual cost, their cost estimates, but those, those estimated values are accurate-ish. And then, of course, the other uh, cost is for doing the merge join itself. And so the cost values, while they are still all estimates, never forget their estimates, their estimates based on calculations uh, against I.O., CPU, and those calculations are pretty good. They're not perfect, but they're pretty good. And so what we've got here is a good, good plan coming out of this. Now, we still haven't addressed that little operator, the, the convert operator, and we haven't addressed the compute scalers, but we'll get to those in a minute. Let me make sure I've got any questions answered. Table spool we've already answered. Is there a possible form scan to have the pool spool being in memory? Why didn't it optimize have the smaller of the two data sets as spool target? It did. The 31,000 was a spool target, so, so it's, it's looping against the 31,000 rows. It always goes to the smaller one was always on top, the larger one's always on bottom. That's how it works. And so it, it, it optimized it the, the right way in that case. Let's do this. Uh, I have no idea what a good value is. We'll try 3245. I think that works. And you'll notice that came back a little quicker. Did we actually get any results? No. Hang on. Let's do this. just to get a real number. 43661, there we go. That should have got us, hey, awesome. Now you'll notice we've got a completely different execution plan yet again. Playing around, I love playing around with the same tables and just slowly building on the plans because it gives you a good idea of how the optimizer is working and how plans get resolved because you understand exactly how we've made those modifications to the queries over time so it comes out. So in this case the select operator now is pulling from a nested loops join again but this nested loop join is, is incredibly efficient in this situation. It's pulling through those compute scalar operators again which we will get to in just a second and now it's doing two clustered index seeks, each of which is 50% of the cost. And let's see how accurate that might be. If you take a look at the properties, the estimated number of rows is one. The actual number of rows is one. The estimated cost is uh, 3125. If we take a look at this, the estimated number of rows is 8.8. .8. If ever you wanted to, to know whether or not these numbers are estimates, find me 0.8 of a row and I will, I will give you an award. But 8.8 .8 rows, the actual number of rows is 15, the estimated I.O. costs 3125. They are the same. So these are the same values, 50%, 50%. Notice though, there is one other cost, 1%. Did you ever wonder if the calculations on these costs are 100% accurate? Well, since we got to 101% on a really simple query, my guess is, no, these um, calculations are not actually perfect in every possible way. So don't be shocked when you see stuff like this. Or, and, and we can get into some really wild queries where, where the numbers get insane. But, you know, just to, don't, don't freak out that this, this adds up to 101%. It's always going to be 100% for real, but the numbers you, uh, you may see from the calculations could be off. Don't, don't sweat that. So let's identify these extra operators. We've seen these things forever. We've got this compute scaler in there. What the heck is it doing? Well, let's take a look. What is it? A compute scaler computes new values from the existing values in a row. Well, that's not very helpful. 
So where do we go? We always go to the properties. So click on that. We've got the defined values. We've got the output list. Well, the defined value seems to have a calculation. Let's take a look at the little ellipsis. If I can get to it without, hang on, the uh, the control for the, uh, hang on one second. Every time I go to that, the control for the um, webs, the the webinar is is popping in front of me. Give me a second. I gotta get control back on the screen. My apologies. Little technical glitch. At least we're not crash like last time. There we go. Awesome. Okay. Apologize about that. Let's just get that so we can see it. So what's this thing doing? It's running a calculation. It's doing a scalar operator is null SO plus convert in varcar 23 sales order sales uh, order ID blah 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 blah. It's doing a calculation. This is a calculated column. What we've got here is a calculated column. This is great. Now, why is it a warning? Well, it's telling us that the calculation that it's doing, the conversion that it's doing in this case, could cause problems with the um, cardinality, with the query optimization cardinality estimator. Well, why? Well, because it's doing a convert in VARCAR 23 from sales order ID, which is a number. It's taking a number and converting it to a string and then putting that out in a value. That potentially could lead to cardinality problems down the road if we are using this for filtering criteria. Now, in this case, we are not. We are not using the calculated column. We're just using the sales order ID. So what we have here is a warning, but it's a false warning. It's a warning we can ignore. But we can only ignore it after we've identified where it's coming from and why it's there. Now that we know, we can completely ignore this going forward. What we can't do, someone asked me at one point, is can you turn it off? And no, you can't. It's just going to stay there. Every time you look at this plan, you're going to see the warning because the warning's built in. There's no way to turn it off. It's just something the optimizer does. But now, we've again, we've identified the extra operator and we've identified what it is, why it's there. We no longer have to worry about it. You've got a plan here in this case that's really straightforward. It's very understandable. Oh, and also, we should take a look at the select operator real quick. One extra bit of value here. Good enough plan found. Now, early termination means that the optimization process stopped. Now, you'll notice it still went through a full optimization, but what it means is, is that the optimizer goes through multiple layers of optimization. And some of the optimization layers are quick, easy, fast. And in this case, it found a plan within one of those early um, uh, optimization levels, and that matched a series of mathematical calculations inside the optimizer. Those, by the way, don't ask me what those calculations are. I do not know. But it matched the calculations inside the optimizer and said, hey, this is a good enough plan. We don't need to go through any more optimization. It's good enough. Are there, the, is the potential there for finding a perfect plan? Yes, but it's going to have to go over and over again. In this case, it found a good enough plan and it was done. And it, and it spit back out and kept going. This is a great thing to see. Good enough plan found is awesome. If you see full and no reason for early termination, that's okay. It means it went through a full optimization process and everything's fine. It found a good plan and, and out it came. It just didn't terminate early. That's okay. It's when you see timeout, optimization level full, and or sorry, optimization level timeout, and and it, so it went through full optimization, but it gave up. It stopped trying to find a good plan. That's when you have concerns. Um, usually, that happens when the plans are extremely complex for really really huge queries. Uh, you don't have a whole lot of control over this. The only way you can make it succeed is to make it less complex. Just, just how it works. Okay. Zoom back out. So there are questions. 
I've seen the property show a computed column warning even though it is a persisted uh, computed column, meaning the calculation took place on the data. Why is this? Um, I don't know, Mark. It's not one I've seen myself. I would have to look that up. I, I honestly, I, I don't have a good answer for you right now. Um, why are there four computed scalar operators? Is there something showing up for each one? Well, yeah, you're going to have to look at each one to identify what it's doing. So this one's doing something different. Uh, hang on, we're zoomed out, aren't we? That's not, it's not nice. I mean, this one's doing something different. So this one's doing calculation of total due. This one's doing something different. It's doing a calculation. It does have a convert implicit again, but it's doing unit price conditions this time. It's totally different from the last one. And this one's doing yet another calculation. Um, this one's doing line total. So these are two calculations against data from the sales order header table, and these are two calculations against data from the sales order detail table. And so that's how it breaks out. All right, oh, and here's another question. How bad is it to find a parallelism operator? It's not. Uh, parallelism is fine. Uh, if you've got a multi, you know, if you've got a multi-CPU pr um, processing computer, you would like it to use those CPUs. The issue that you may run into, though, is you've got a query where um, parallelism is not conducive to good performance because there's a cost associated with splitting the processing out to multiple CPUs and then pulling it back together. So for for big complex queries for large data sets, parallel processing is awesome. But for smaller data sets, parallel processing is very painful. So um, what you want to look at there is your cost threshold for parallelism, see if it's set high enough uh, to ensure that you're, you're um, getting uh, parallelism only for appropriate plans. That said, there is an exception to what I'm saying when we start talking about column store indexes, but I don't want to dig down that hole just right now because uh, it's, it's a deep hole and we'll be there for a long time. Let's see, what are some of the common operations you look for in high cost or bad? At well, I, it, go back to the list that I gave you, scans, um, the most costly operators and those things. That's what you're going to look for. Why is the plan doing those when we didn't ask it to do so? Well, we did ask it to do so. You'll notice I'm doing select star. So I'm ref referencing each of those columns. If I change this query, let's do that actually. Oops. Hang on, zoom back out because I can't see what I'm doing. If I change this, sales order ID and SOD.sales order ID. So I'm pulling one column from each table. It's the same column from each table, but it's one column from each table. And if I run this query as is, we will get a different execution plan. And that execution plan, <coughs> excuse me, that execution plan does not include the scalar operators. Why? Because I'm not referencing those columns anymore. Uh, it's only because I had that select star in place that it was doing those things. What can you say about sort warnings or hash match warnings, temp DB spells? Okay, um, well, those are indicators that you are hitting issues with whatever the query is doing. Um, it's using, uh, it doesn't have enough memory. Um, usually this is because statistics uh, mismatch, meaning it thinks it's returning one row, so it allocates memory for one row. It's actually returning one million rows, and so it has to spill that data out to temp DB. And so it, there wasn't enough memory allocated for the query. That's frequently an indication that your statistics are out of date, so it's something to look for. All right, let's, how are we doing on time? Ah, 10 minutes left. Good, I want to get to this. Exec, SP, uh, I can't remember the name of it, hang on. I need a new brain. If anyone's selling one, I, I'm in the market. Let's see, programmability, store procedures. Oh, it's address by city, okay. By city, and then we'll pass in London. Okay, so this is a store procedure. And we're gonna capture the actual, actual execution plan for that store procedure. It returned 434 rows, not important to our situation. Let's zoom in. Now, this plan, simple plan, it's not hard to understand. Um, it does have a missing index indicator up here. Uh, that is a potential missing index. Do not assume it's accurate. Um, but let's take a look at the operator, uh, first operator, because you always want to start there. 
Now the addition, it does a full optimization, it did good enough plan found, all that's good, but the addition we have here is the parameter list. And I like to point this out because this is really, really where things get important. Inside an actual plan, you will see a runtime value for parameters. Inside all plans, you will see a compile time value for parameters. This compile time value is how you start to deal with and address bad parameter sniffing. Let's zoom back out and take a look at something else. What if we run this for a city of Mentor? Now the execution plan we get is identical. Does everyone agree? You do, don't worry. Take a look at, oops, take a look at, I said, the properties for the select operator and we get the parameter list and now you can see the runtime value. Oops, oh, why'd you do that, Grant? You can see the compile time and runtime value for that. The compile time value is London because that was how we, when we ran it the first time, we ran it for London. The runtime value this time is for Mentor. So why is this important? If you're in a situation where, let's say every so often, every two or three days, suddenly the query is running bad, and if you hit recompile, then it starts running good again, you might want to capture the execution plans and then take a look at the compile time values because if we take this query and never, ever, ever, ever do what I'm going to do. I'm just doing this for expedience sake. Uh, DBCC, free proc cache, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. There are better ways to run this than what I'm doing right now. Don't do what I just did. Okay, please, please, please pay no attention to that part of the demo. That was bad. I'm just, because I'm typing everything, I wanted to do it quickly. You'll notice this time I've got a completely different execution plan. The reason being the city of Mentor, oops, the city of Mentor returns one row. The city of London returns 400. And the difference between run one row and 400 rows is a different execution plan. And so the optimizers made a series of different choices and this is parameter sniffing in action and one of these plans causes problems. Now which of these plans causes problems is completely dependent upon your data. In this case, London is the outlier. That 400 row value is the outlier. It's, it's very different from most of the rest of the data. Most of the rest of the data has about 30 rows in it. For mo most of the rest of the data, this nested loop operation is a very efficient, good query. That other plan with the merge is less efficient for everything except London. Now here's where things get fun. The data dictates which of these plans is better, but then your business dictates which of these plans you want to keep because then the question comes down to are more calls made to London, which has bigger data sets, in which case, hey, let's make London run fast with that bigger data set, or are more calls made against smaller data sets and we want that smaller plan. So it's, it's, uh, then you get into a whole dance and you have to make all these decisions and it has to be a combination of both business and data to make those determinations. So it's, it's a lot of fun. That's how things go. All right, we've got how much time? Just a couple minutes, right? Uh, a few more minutes. All right, so let's let's stop that. Get back here. That's all the demos I wanted to hit because we've hit all the highlights of, of what to look for in execution plans. Now um, we're going to skip that bit. All right. Cool. Let's answer any ex outstanding questions.